My name is Agnes Xu Ni Hao. Uh, my name is Agnes Xu. I'm the resident scholar and director for arts and culture at China Institute. I understand one of our um, former head China Institute is with us this afternoon because we are so deeply honored to have a very special waiting uh, guest this afternoon who will enlighten us uh, with your journey um, from China, Hong Kong, Taiwan to the United States. Um, we're just we're just so delighted to have all of you joining us this afternoon, and uh, I would like to introduce our, as I would call, our resident sage of China Institute, Benches. Uh, Mr. Benoit, and my dear friend. Thanks. Hardly, hardly. Don't trust Agnes with everything else but this. <laughs> Well, this event has been in the making for the past six or seven months when it was suggested by uh, the president of China Zoo, who is giving a party tonight in her Connecticut, Connecticut home. That's why she is sadly absent. And she asked me to convey her sincere apology to Dr. Wong. So when she suggested to my co-chair, my name is Ben Wong, and I have a wonderful co-chair in Dr. He Yong. <laughs> and when Sarah suggested to two of us, she says, would it, would you, what do you think? Uh, she said, I met a legend in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, we, I, had the, um, I had the honor of being seated next to him and uh, during a very important lunch. And, um, we were just overjoyed, you know. I mean, what could the answer have been? You know, no, but what are we blind? So quickly we said, yes, yes, when? Then we started the uh, correspondence. And um, I'm, we're just so elated. So can you imagine how happy I am? So that's why that might um, explain the overly emotional state that I'm in <laughs> as, the, as the American uh, English writers, they say, great emotion renders one speechless, and I am on the verge of being speechless. But speak, I must. So, <laughs> here I am. Here I am. <clears throat> if I were to uh, give a citation of all the achievements and accomplishments of Dr. Wang, then I'm afraid I will have to be here at the podium for two hours. <laughs> and, and I think that would be a big taboo. <laughs> so, but a brief introduction there must be. So let me start. <clears throat> Dr. Wang Ji made his early and lasting brilliant career as librarian at the Library of Congress, where he built the Chinese collection from 300,000 to over a million volumes. And that in itself is an astounding achievement. Co-founder of the US China Policy Foundation and founder of Washington Journal of Modern China, Dr. Wang Ji has taught history and US China relations at Georgetown University since 1968. He has also taught and lectured at Columbia University, Yale Uni University, among others. Dr. Wang's publications include America and China Since 1945, A Brief History, George W. Bush and China, Policies, Problems, and Partnership. From what I just read, a few accomplishments that I cited. We can tell that Dr. Wang, indeed, he's a living legend and of Chinese culture and matters concerning the U.S.-China relations. For this event, Dr. Wang, for our benefit, will sign his memoir, A Compelling Journey from Peking to Washington. He is instrumental and the driving force 
in the U.S.-China relationship. But to say this is a gross understatement. Does that explain my excitement over his visit to our little German society? So I'm just overjoyed. <clears throat> well, the past few days, I've been do doing my homework. Actually, it was not. It was a homework done with pleasure. I have devoured his latest book, which, as I said before, is called A Compelling Journey from Peking to Washington. Indeed, it's a compelling reading. It's fascinating. There is no dogmatic, it's not pedantic, it's fascinating, historical, and it's a Bildungsroman of a great man and his view of the United States of America and China and their relationship. So after reading his book, a few lines by Wordsworth entered my mind when Wordsworth wrote the following line, the following lines, enough of science and art. Close up those barren leaves, come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. And here we have a man with a heart that watches and receives in Dr. Wang Ji. So without further ado, <coughs> I will present to you the preeminent one and only Dr. Wang Ji. <laughs>
I'm very good school study the best we can. Don't start with any parties, any parties, and just study. That was going to come. So I followed his advice. I didn't get involved in any politics. In those years, the 1949, because our students from mainland China, not many students from Taiwan. I did not study undergraduate. I was only the three or four Chinese students from university study undergraduate, freshmen study English. So I was kind of lonely, but I had four students, Chinese students, in my honey college. They all from mainland China, from Hong Kong. I think that both of them gone. And maybe only one is still alive here at the university. I'm not talking since 1950s. Anyway, this is my beginning of my challenge with involvement. My most recent visit here was 1985, when Mr. Wang Ge, a Chinese artist, art historian, and a published a book about Chinese art, also a Chinese real book uh, expert. When he was at the head of here in 1985, he sponsored one day conference on Chinese real books. Since I was at the uh, head of a Chinese collection in the Library of Congress, he invited me here to talk about the real book, real Chinese real book in the Library of Congress. So I was had the honor to be here. I was a public gentleman here, and uh, there was a lot of people who want to know about Library of Congress. And, and uh, this is my, <coughs> after that, I wish I could remember I come here again. This is the first time since 1985. It's a long time. It's a long time. When I came over here today, I told the driver, I said, uh, you, you, you go out from uh, Lexington and turn up. You can't, one way, go to this place, you have to go to 66 Avenue and make a turn all the time. Anyway, this is my uh, uh, personal experience with Chinese Institute. I want to thank again everybody uh, in the Chinese Institute and also my friends here in, uh, in today's event. And uh, I don't know what, how much I learned from it, but I will be happy to tell you my experience. And uh, the, this book was published late last year. This is another book I've written in Chinese, published in Hong Kong two years ago. This one will be published in mainland China shortly this year. And it's, a, uh, it's published by commercial press in Chinese. It's different than this one. It's not translation, but uh, if you can tell your life story, you can't change much your life, but it's a different approach. This is a book, and Ben has that mentioned, about my book about George W. Bush in China. And this was published about two years ago. And I don't want to tell you how many books I published. I have two more who come out this year. And, <laughs> uh, uh, one on Library Congress, one on U.S. Channel History was published by New York Publishing. Now, let's get back to my book, A Compiling Journey. I don't know if Compiling Journey is the right book. Uh, we'll cover it now. I, before I sent to the publisher, I asked my son. My son was born here, and uh, he is a correspondent in Washington Post. But he doesn't cover politics, only sports. <laughs> only sports. <laughs> Football, basketball, baseball, <laughs> boxing. He says cover boxing on the city last week. And uh, lacrosse, you name it. Every game, he's expert. I'm not expert on anything. I don't even know the, the rules of baseball. I don't have much sense in so interested in sports. But he's now a senior editor in the sports section of Washington Post. So this is something I did not expect. I have sense in interested in sports. I'm not interested. I'm not taking sports, but I have no interest in sports. I'm interested in Chinese art, Chinese literature, Chinese culture, Chinese drama. And when I was a student, I married you from the later of 1952, I wrote several Chinese plays. In fact, the first Chinese modern drama performed in a theater was written by me in 1952. Performed in North Maryland, or the theater. That was 1952. March 8th, Women's Day of China. And the, 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 book, the title of the play, Long Live Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, uh, about my uh, younger days, uh, uh, funny stories, okay. And uh, I came here, uh, I decided to come to the United States. 
my, I, my son told me, I said, ask, I said, you tell me, what title I'm going to use in my phone book? We talk about different titles. Full Feeling American Dream. He does to call him. Don't say Full Feeling American Dream. Everybody has a dream. Why is it American Dream? Okay. And he said, my son said, Daddy, you have a trip very competitive. Said, what do you mean competitive? <laughs> And I don't understand the word. He said, "Here, he said, come on, he said, use the word. You can't go along with that word. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was born here. He said, you better than mine, kid. I said, okay, son, I didn't hear you. So this is one with the title, the title, Senate of Corruption, the Compelling Journey. I said, there's something missing. He said, Daddy, use bring a new life in America. I said, okay, that's, that's better. Make the book more uh, complete, the title. But that's how the book title came about. Then the publisher, it took them about two years to get it published. I submitted it probably 2008, 2009, 2009. And then last year, they sent me the proof. They wanted to prove back in one minute. So that's a lot of typos in the book here. So you have to, if you find anything wrong, forgive me. And I try the best I could. But if any mistake, then I just give it you. Now, the book covers probably four parts of my life. The first part was from 1930s, since I remember things, 1936, 37, as a kid. So I, how I grew up in China, from Marco Polo Bridge in 1937, July 7th, and I saw the Japanese invade China, invade Beijing, as a kindergarten student, but I remember. I saw that the, uh, the Chinese army wounded Back in the city of Beijing, I was in ice cream hospital. I said, what's going on here? And the, the servant told me, Japanese attack China. I didn't have no idea what it means, attack. So we went home, and then my mother said, let's go, let's leave the city. We, leave, we left the city in two days, went to Nanjing. At that time, Nanjing was the capital of the uh, Republic of China. And, uh, that's how I experienced the first war between China and the Japanese. I'm not sure everybody here knows. The war lasted from 1937 until 1945. How many years? Eight years. Eight years. During the eight years, my family first moved to Kaipun, Kadem Province. Because my father was the Deputy Commander of the First World War in Henan, Anhui, and Hubei. Because my father was in charge of the Manchuria, Northeast China armies. So five armies, about 170,000 people. After Young Marshal, Zhang Liang, state a coup d'etat in Xi'an, after we gave the invasion in 1776, he went in the house of red, seen in And my father was the one commanding the Manchurian troops. Too. The headquarter in those years was in Henan, Kaifeng. In the summer of 1937, as a young kid, first grade, we moved to a, a, a mountain resort called the Rooster Mountain Resort, Yigongshan, which is Order Hubei and Henan. Not too far from Xinjiang, if you know the Chinese geography. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we stayed there. All the, the so called senior Chinese officers, Guomindang officers, generals, at least five generals, the family stayed in Rusu Mountain Resort. Sun Yen Yun, Sun Zhen, you know the names. And this is all, Sun Zhen was governor of Henan. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the people who've seen. So I had a chance to, to meet all these people. Two army commanders from Manchuria. One later on killed in Shanghai battle. This is a, my first experience. I could not forget it. But uh, Japan continued to move toward the Rusu Mountain. So our family decided to move to Wuhan. When I, when, when my mother and myself and my sister and two brothers and plus servant, we go down to the, from the mountain to the railroad station. We 
we wait for our train. At that time, we can have a special train just for us, for, for, for one family. We wait at the platform. I saw a train coming to the. I saw that's our train, but I didn't. It didn't. It was not for us. I saw several hundred wounded Chinese soldiers, arms coming off, legs coming off. But as a kid, I, I didn't. Think, I said, "What's going on here?" I asked my mother. He said, "This is some wounded soldiers." I said, "Nobody take care of them. No, no doctors. No. They were hungry. They're shouting at the government. This is what." So about my training army retreated from the battle, battlefield to somewhere I did not know. So my mother, we cooked about 300 mantel mm -hmm. Chinese bread and eggs, boiled eggs, distributed to boiled soldiers. I had no deep impression in my mind. I will never forget how bad a war can be. But again, in those years, fighting Japanese was a necessity. Because China was invaded by Japan since 1931, Mukden incident, and later on, Marco Polo Bridge. But China had no way to, to really win the war. But China said, still put up a fight with Japan. So after our train arrived, and my mother said, just go on the train. Don't worry about the other soldiers. And then we went to Wuhan. We stayed there until oh, 1938, after Chinese New Year. Every day, the Japanese airplane bombed Wuhan, not the coast, hiding in bomb shelters. I don't know how many people have experienced something. Do you have any experience with bomb shelter? No, right? This is my personal experience as a kid. I don't know how many Chinese students now in the United States have this kind of experience. I'm not trying to tell I'm an old man, I want to tell my experience. I'm going to tell you, as a young child, six, seven years old, I experienced this kind of, I kind of to see the atrocity of the Japanese. The people just dying on the street in Wuhan. So my father decided to resign from the government court because there was no way for them to fight for the Japan. So we moved to Hong Kong. We rode the train, Yuhan Railway, from Wuhan to Guangzhou. It took us three days to get there. When we finished Guangzhou, I still remember we stayed in the best hotel in Guangzhou, Aichin Hotel. That was the tallest building in Guangzhou in 1939. My father said, Japan is going to occupy Guangzhou. Where is Let's move to Hong Kong. That's how I made my first trip to Hong Kong in 1939, spring. When I came to Hong Kong, Ah, I said, listen, the modern city. So many things. Look at the, you can buy Coca Cola. You can buy chocolate. You can buy corned beef. And I don't have it before. So we moved to the hotel just by the harbor, Hong Kong Sat, called North American Hotel, Meizhou Fan Yen. And then my mother said, just buy some bread, make some sandwich, and slice of corned beef. I enjoy the corned beef so much. This is a good place to live. I like Hong Kong. That's my beginning for school in Hong Kong as a first grade to learning Cantonese. I went to a school called Hua Xiao Xiao here, over to Chinese elementary school, in the mid-level mid of Hong Kong side, Robbins Road. We stay in Robbins Road, I remember the number, number 47, Robbins Road. That was my most happy. <laughs> and uh, I remember I ate ice cream in Dairy Farm. I'm sure in some of you in Hong Kong, that's the best ice cream place. Also, also I love it. I don't know how to use it. And I love it. This is the best place for uh, eating uh, hot fudge sandwich, ice cream, ice cream soda. Every night, my mother took me to I love it. I enjoyed that. I said, this is really paradise. <laughs> well, first I in Hong Kong, but in Hong Kong in that time, it was paradise for many so-called refugees. Because everywhere in China was in the Japanese army, only in Chongqing, the wartime capital, and that's the Chinese 
bond that you're in every day. <coughs> so Chaka said, keep sending cable to my father. Say, you have to come to Feng you can't sit in Hong Kong. That's not for you. You must come back to Baijiang East. This is my contact I stayed in Hong Kong at middle school. The first few minutes, I couldn't get along with the kids because they speak Cantonese. After a few minutes, I spoke very good Cantonese. So I became one of the Cantonese students to the library. And that's why I learned Cantonese language. <laughs> I still speak one time or time. Not often, but when I speak to China, I speak Cantonese. But people speak by China. I kind of. In Hong Kong, I began. Mean, from 1939 to the fall 1939, the said, your, your father cannot stay in Hong Kong. Either you come to Chongqing or you go somewhere else. So he asked me to go to the U.S. as head of military delegate for Chinese national government. That's the reason to make sure you're not going to support Wang Jingwei in a puppet regime in 1939. Wang Jingwei went to Shanghai, organized the puppet regime, <coughs> Wei Zhengfu, with Zhou Fohai, Chen Gong Guo, these people, in Shanghai, later on. And they asked my father to be the, the, the minister of the Department of War, Ju Zheng Wu. My father turned out, I can't I do that. Do that. I'll be a, a traitor for our country. The Chen Kai said, no, sir. He said, if you should go to the U.S. representing us to investigate what's the American military mission, first my father, he didn't speak English. He come here, I don't have to. But he insisted he must go to the U.S. So my father, okay. He went. So we have moved from, from Hong Kong. My mother didn't want to go to the United States. So we have to go to Shanghai with my sister and mother, my father and my two brothers, and two personal secretaries who went to the U.S. Stayed here from 1939 to 1941, July. He didn't like me. He didn't speak English. But he enjoyed eating hamburgers, milkshake. He learned me letters from, from San Francisco. One time he enjoyed visiting Niagara Falls, Yellowstone Park, and all of that. Uh, he, he, he had that time ambassador to the US for Dr. Hu Shi. Hu Shi was a great scholar of China from 19. He came out of Columbia, and uh, he and my father were a very close friend when he was Beijing University president. So when he came over here, Wu Shi took a charge of So that's why later on, I had a chance to, to talk to Wu Shi in Washington this year, in China Institute here, in 1949, the 50s, before he go back to Taiwan. So my father, uh, decided to go back to Shenzhen. He returned from San Francisco back to Hong Kong. So my mother and my sister, we moved from Shanghai to Hong Kong in the summer, July, 1941. My mother said, Shenzhen too hot in summer. Let's wait until winter time for Shenzhen. By the time December wanted to go, her harbor time. Japan invaded her house. I remember very clearly on December 8th morning, I was going to school with my, with my, with our servant, took me to the elementary school, and they said, come back, Japan attacked Hong Kong. I said, that was Hong Kong. I saw the Japanese gunboat chasing the British boat in the harbor. And then we went to come back to our home. I remember the home, the home our home was at that time was in Dai Hong Road, Da Hong Dao, just in front of the, the Tiger Bomb Garden. I'm sure you know the Tiger Bomb Garden. When we were that's it's like a thin park. They have a different kind of paintings and pagoda. And I go there every weekend to just play there. And we didn't know. Underneath that Tiger Mangan, Tiger Mangan was a British fortress. So our home in front of the Tiger Mangan was set by Japanese on Kowloon side. Morning and night, 
of house project. The top floor is what the Japanese boundary. So we have to move out to the Happy Valley, the front of the home is near the race course. So we stayed there during the Japanese invasion of Hong Kong. At the end of the end of Japan occupied Hong Kong on the Christmas Day in 1948. No way for the British to defend. The Japan took over Hong Kong. I think this is all in my book. I just want to give you my experience what happened in Hong Kong and my childhood days. I didn't feel any, uh, I, I was not afraid. I still go out to sleep to, to watch movies. I remember I saw a movie called Played by Charlie Chaplin, The Great Dictator. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very good movie. I still have a DVD now. And a uh, great dictator. Kind of a gratitude. I just happened to see those movies in Hong Kong. I still go to see them out of Japan, but the movies are still open. So one day, we'll, I remember, waiting as come after lunch, we had to be staying home. And it's all of a sudden, about 10, Japanese motor cars parked in front of our home. My mother just worried. Japanese army, I arrested my father once. As a kid, I looked out the window, a Japanese uniform person, together with two, person, two, two soldiers, I found those. The servant opened the door. And the Japanese officer gave a business card. And the children gave my father. My father didn't come in. Become just General Sakai <coughs> was occupying general in Hong Kong. The number one commander in Hong Kong. He visited my father here and my father was classmate in Japan in 1915. <laughs> so he came over not to arrest my father. Asked my father, what can I do for you? <laughs> He said, General, I was asked by Tojo <coughs> to see you here. The war criminal. But he was all classmates from 1915 to 1915 in Japan. So the Japanese general, General Sakai, offered my father, what do you want? Okay. We need food. The Japanese burned down the granary, the destroyed for rice and then food. So no problem. We delivered two chocolate food for you. <coughs> he to, my father said, I want to go to Chongqing. And he said, that I can't do. I can't send to Chongqing. You want to go to Beijing, Shanghai, any place I'll send you. Finally, my father couldn't go to Beijing. How many people are going? Well, 40 some people. The general Japanese shop. And 40 some people go to Shanghai. The whole, whole boat will be taking your whole family to go My father was about right. So he assigned a cargo ship to take our whole family from Hong Kong. Now it's the Jin Chan Tree buried there. What's the, the, the dock? And one thousand times, <coughs> took us from Hong Kong to Shanghai. In the meantime, American took the submarines, tried to set torpedo all the Japanese cargo ships. They took three days from Hong Kong to the Shanghai. One to Shanghai, and again, we have very good chance to the Shanghai. Now, I think that the Japanese generals also were human. You can know that. So my father uh, uh, studied Japan first together with Chandrasek. Junction. They were in Japan from 1908 to 1910. And then he got sent back by Yankee Kai to continue to study at the National Academy for another four years from 1915 to 1919. So he met a lot of future Japanese Imperial Army leaders. I don't know what his benefit, you know, but at least he had a chance to not suffer during those uh, four years. So we went, went back to Shanghai, and Shanghai would come back to Tianjin, and Tianjin back to Beijing. So we stayed in Beijing during 
Catholic occupation. Then I started to go to junior high school. By the time World War II ended, I was in thirty years in the time. I remember everything. I studied Japanese for three years and a Japanese teacher. I hate Japanese. <laughs> but the teacher told me, You guys, I know you hate Japanese, but you don't hate the language. You learn a language, always useful. I think what right. I learned two years Japanese. When I come here to the job, I was talking, do you know Japanese? I said, I know Japanese. <laughs> I really know some Japanese. Not, not good, but I can write uh, some simple Japanese uh, transliteration and that kind of stuff. This is my wartime experience. Again, I want to tell you, in 1945, August, when I watched a Chinese play in Beijing theater, the play I remember was about Empress Dai Zixi, the end of Qing Dynasty, Qing Gong Yuan. The play writer was, was Yao Ke, a Yale University drama department writer, among the most popular William Chinese playwright directors. They don't even come out. His play caused problems in Mao's China in 1957. The Qing Gong Yuan. Later on, a movie made it by, played by Zhou Xuan, I'm sure you know Zhou Xuan, mm -hmm. and, and become a very popular movie. I watched a play in Beijing Center. In the middle of a play, everybody shouted, China, Japanese surrender, you have heard it. Everybody come out, come, coming out to the, the theater, celebrate, Germany up and down. I didn't know what happened, I just, I came out of the theater too. Japan, and then listen to the Japanese emperor. Broadcasting surrender. The war started in 1937. The war ended in 1945. I was in Beijing. So I witnessed the beginning and the end of China Japanese War from 37 to 1945. <coughs> I didn't know the implications of the war ended. But this is what I experienced in World War II. I grew up in this kind of Samuel Chapman War period. I don't know how many people here have experienced Samuel Chapman War. No? Probably have nobody had experienced that. Pearl Harbor. Anybody here? Okay. Ben, you have it. This is what the. Uh, uh, I don't know what you, I should. Uh, you have your thought at this. At least I know what is war like. How you're going to be. What's the refugee of your life? As a little bit refugee. Still, if you're, you're a refugee. My, age, my elementary school education and high school education mm -hmm. all during this Sino Japanese War, eight years. <coughs> okay. And after the war, what am I going to do? <coughs> my dream is I watch so many American movies, only go to the United States. The hollow would influence me to come to the United States. <laughs> there are no American movie from 1941 to 1945. After 45, so many American movies come into Beijing City. This is what I told my father. My brothers, they're still in the United States. After they come back, I will go to the United States. <coughs> my father said, You can't do that. You have to finish college before you go to the United States. Great brother. They didn't know anything about Chinese culture. They went to the United States. They didn't know high Chinese history. You must study Chinese university. In two years, we go to the United States. I talked to my mother. I said, what you tell my father? What? Give me a chance to go. My father, with me, she told him, you have to go. That one she going to the United States. That's how I was lucky. My father finally gave in to my mother. I got a chance to go. If I go at that time, the civil war between the Chinese communists and us was at a final stage. My father said, How can you go to the United States? You can't get no, no, no airplane, no train, no boat. What are you going to do? I said, I was riding a bicycle to go to the United States. I did. I rode a truck and ride a bicycle. 
two, two weeks from Beijing, Tianjin, and Changzhou, and Shandong, Yunnan, and then, and then you can see that. These are still under the national Chinese control. Two weeks. I saw it. the countries are China. It's so bad. I told myself, if China has no revolution, it's unfair to the poor people. You have to see how poor was the Chinese farmers, peasants. We stay in the, 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 the house owned by local farmers. It's poor as mattress. Sleep on the floor, eating dry Chinese bread. Gum mantle. That's the only thing you can eat for two weeks. At that time, everybody was hoping when if Mao Zedong really going to, revolution going to succeed, mm -hmm. going to be better, everybody. Nobody going to foresee what happened today in China. But in 1949, there was the, the Mao, no matter what, who, who, who was better than the corruption of Kuomintang. But if you look at Kuomintang, so-called Kuomintang corruption, Jiang Zhong Feng Chen. What is Jiang Zhong Feng Chen? Only four families. Now look at China today. The corruption in China. Probably so many families. But again, how many people remember this? I, I had the uh, chance to, to meet all the Kuomintang leaders. From Chiang Kai shek down to everybody in Nanjing. Because my father was very, I don't know what, what how I should describe him. He always bring me to meet his old friends, the leading leaders of Chinese national government. This one is my son, and he should learn by you what kind of and he should to for that kind of expression for my father. That's why I met so many Chinese officials and scholars during my high school days in China. <coughs> this was a healthy day on. They know me. From Shanghai, after the Chinese Communists took over Beijing, so called liberated Beijing in, in January 1949, I was in Beijing. I went on the street to welcome the, 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 the Liberation Army. But you mean I was in the other city from the United States. But you need a Luqiao, a, 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 a permission to leave Beijing. Of course, I know the public public security uh, commissioner when I went to see him. I said, Commissioner Tan, Tan Jing Wen. I said, Tan, Tan Jing Wen, I want to go to uh, Shanghai. How for? I said, my girlfriend in Shanghai. Which is true, I had a girl in high school. What's her name? I gave her name. I got it. permission. Make sure you come back now. I said, come back in a few years. <coughs> I got a good help. The permission to travel from Beijing by truck, by bicycle, by <coughs> horse car. Two weeks. To Qingdao. On Qingdao, I bought an airplane ticket to Shanghai. Shanghai was a chaos. I don't want to get out in Shanghai. That was March 1949. <coughs> I don't know, I don't, I don't want to bore you, but it's the history of China in the 1940s, 49. And at that time, the Chinese Communist Army already across the Yangtze River. Shanghai will be so called liberated in Versailles. I went to a China travel service in Shanghai. I have a classmate. His father worked there. I said then, Yang Tongxie. I said, can I get an airplane ticket to Hong Kong? He said, no, airline, airplane, airplane go to Hong Kong. I want to go to Taiwan. I said, Taiwan too, okay, I go to Taiwan. Can't get tickets. But his father came to see me. My, my, my classmate father, his father, 
two hours to go. <coughs> go like a, two hours. I thought, oh, not for me. I can get you to Taipei with two hours to go. I said, okay, I get two hours to go. I went to see my father's friend. It's a coin. It's all right. I said, coin, I need two hours to go. Would you lend it to me? I'll pay you back. Say that. I give you. He turned around. Go, go about the safe. Give me two hours. Go. Take it. What are you doing? I said, I'm going to Hong Kong, Taiwan. Okay. Go. I took two hours. The, 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 the travel, China travel, I give two hours to go to the the assistant manager. And he told me, it's wrong. Don't think I take it bribe. I'm not taking it go. Somebody else is going to take it go. If I give it to me, I'll give it to somebody else. Tomorrow afternoon, you're going to meet two pilots in the Longhua Airport. Longhua was a military airport. So I wait outside the gate. Two airport, airport, Chinese airport pilots. Are you one chief? I said, yes. Come in. We we'll walk into the airport. Follow us. We, we, I bought a small green military airplane to my parents. I got an airplane. Where are the passengers? What do you mean by You are the only passengers. How many people want to go to go to Hawaii and Hong Kong? You didn't take no, we didn't take them. I only take you. So two pilots I saw. We took off from the Taipei in the evening. I'll be getting the you know, Songshan Airport. Pilot told me, it's wrong. Do you have a car to pick up? I said, no. Where are you going at? Like, Sun Chambe Lu, Sun Yuan, the third section of Sun Chan, North Road. It's a long walk. I said, yes. I walk anyway. I carry a small suitcase. I walk from Sun Chan Airport all the way to Sun Chan, North Road, third section. Three hours for a night. When you're young, doing a lot of crazy things. <laughs> I want to see my friend to go to Hong Kong. If I can get a passport, go to America, and come to visa, then I go to the United States. As far as admission, that's already done. I got a scholarship from Hong Kong. Four years. No more war in That's a good deal, right? <laughs> I worked with Taipei. My father had a, had a house, property, in the same section. But uh, nobody lived there. So I went to the neighbor, my father's friend. He also had a house in the same, in the same street. He said, how can you didn't tell me to come here? <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you. He said, come here, come here. And I said, I want to go to the United States. He said, let's, let's go to somebody and help him. Well, I made the story short. So I waited for two more weeks, uh, two weeks, waiting for the Chinese Catholic bishop for Nanjing, Paul Yibin. <coughs> Yibin was the number one of a Catholic priest in China, say, Archbishop <coughs> Nanjing. He said, you'll be in Taipei. He is sent to go to Hong Kong. So I went to Hong Kong to see him. He said, Go to see Father Gao in love with your home university. He gave you a test. You pass the test, you go to the United States. <laughs> and I put on the test. Not ICT, no. Language, no. Just write a Chinese article. One page. Why you want to go to the United States? I finished. It's good. Then, so go to, you got scholarship from my K university. Milwaukee. I said, is there any China coming? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I know China coming. I said, Milwaukee. I said, I want to go and play that in Chinese food. He said, you're a boy. <laughs> but I, I love Chinese. I get to give a Chinese friend. So he said, come back tomorrow. <clears throat> How about New York City? And that's fine. <laughs> Mahatma College. I got a letter from Mahatma College, four years. 
astonishing. Don't get bored. He said, a lot of Chinese in New York City. The Chinatown New York City. And that's fine. Sorry. I began to process my possible application in Guangzhou. And then he went to Hong Kong. Archbishop Yubin took me to American Council in Hong Kong. That's, the council at that time was 6 4 in Shanghai, Hong Kong Central Bank. Mr. Miller was the vice council. He walked in with me. He said, Mr. Miller, my friend, Wang Ji, wants to go to the United States. Do you have a visa for him? Wait for one hour. Yeah. I'm not trying to tell you I got a free stating, but it's a free, but it is. So I was not. And then he told me to air, air China Air. Era office. The general manager, Mr. Liu, Liu Jing Yi, worked with my father in 1993. I went to see Archbishop to go to his office. I told Mr. Liu, I said, I'm going to the United States and my airplane ticket. He said, okay. He signed it and slid. Go down and take a ticket. And I paid more. Give a ticket. I went downstairs. The lady gave me a ticket. He was there to look. Uh, you guys are just unfair. A lot of people, you couldn't go to that. You couldn't that for what? You never even graduated from uh, college. I said, never mind, let me take my ticket. <laughs> I took my ticket. And I waited for about two weeks. I celebrated in Hong Kong. I went, I went to re re record Spain to celebrate. <laughs> my visa, my airline ticket, waiting for September 10th to take off, take off from Kaita Airport to And the rest of my story in the United States. I don't want to tell you how much it's too long to tell you, but I just want to let you know I was a lucky young man from childhood to college days. But I always talk to myself, I talk after that moment, he said, you must be good to me. You should not let the people help you if you request the help. First, you want to help the student do something for China, do something for the United States. I said, what do you mean do something for the United States? I'm not an American citizen. I waited for the last day I applied a green card. My father told me you should never be an American citizen, a Chinese or a Chinese. He said, your brother served in the U.S. Army at the end of World War II. He was not selected as a resident. I found very, very upset. How can my son be as a resident? I So I remember, I remember that, that kind of a comment. I told him, the immigration officer said, the immigration officer said, you know, if you don't apply, we have to come by you. We can deport you. No place to go. PRC didn't want you. Taiwan didn't want you. How about, where are you going to go? A, a DP, this paper, I don't want to be disciplined. So finally, the immigration officer and press me, Mr. Wong, you must apply a green card application. You mean you get a green card, you don't have to be. You can change it later on, this is how much time you So when I submit my application, the last five minutes, the last day, I can apply. I got my green card. <laughs> and then I met my future wife, and we got married, and uh, I'm here. I got a job at the Library of Congress. The same year I got my green card. Before that, I worked for State Department for three years. Come to talk about the State Department. I was lucky again. I was in Beijing from 1945 to 46, 47, 48. I always go to an American council in Beijing. I met a number of American uh, diplomats. One gentleman called Howard Sullenberger. He was a missionary man. He lived in China for 18 years. He always talked to me, showed me American movies in the U.S. U.S. I enjoyed that. My brother became American citizen when he got married in Beijing. The American law required you must marry with a American counselor of embassy witnessed the marriage, the wedding. So when you see him at Miss Sullenberger, my brother get married, would you mind to come out to be the witness 
you know, happy, happy. That's how we become good friends. I, I, I forgot about him when I come in, I said, I didn't talk to him. One day I was in a Chinese restaurant in, in DC, about 1955. He walked in, hey, when did you come here? I've been here since 49. What are you doing? I said, what are you asking? You want to work for me? I said, where are you going to work? Work for State I said, I'm not even a citizen. Don't worry about it. You come see me tomorrow. You're a citizen. You're a foreign state partner. I went there. You want to teach Chinese? My Chinese is not that good. You're a And so I'm going to offer a job. Starting next week, teaching Chinese for junior foreign service officers. That's how I met an Edinburgh Christian. American diplomats, including the future American ambassador to China, Ambassador David Hanoi. Uh -huh. He was in my class. Uh -huh. Quite a few. I don't want to mention too many names. This is the, this is example. But he said, "Look, there was somebody. I didn't look for a job. The job looked for me." Uh -huh. In the meantime, Georgetown professor looking for a person teaching Chinese. Georgetown University. <coughs> this is what I came up with, State Department, U.S. Department, and uh, because I was a State Department instructor for three years, I trained the future American diplomat. In the meantime, I was going out at Georgia University who had a project, microfilm of a Japanese archive. <coughs> Japanese Army, <coughs> Navy, Air Force, which was confiscated by General Douglas MacArthur in Japan, brought in by thousands of boxes of archives. Japanese, Japanese, how they plan to invade China, how they plan to invade Pearl Harbor, this kind of archive, mm -hmm. all in the archive. So he applied a grant with four foundations, required for three or four years to microfilm all the archives. He hired me as a student for a project. I took it. But unfortunately, at the end of that year, which is seven, Japan demanded to take him back to Tokyo. The state of Giving, in, so they took him back. The one thing is about 200 reels back of him, student library Congress. That's how I got my library Congress job. Mm -hmm. It's like, I also saw many names in the Japanese archive, especially in my father, Wang Jingwei, Yu Shao Xi, and mm -hmm. the archive covers communist archive, Gomita archive, Papua New Guinea archive. It's a fascinating archive. Now you can't see them anymore, but they took them back in Japan. That's why I became interested in Chinese history. You see so many names. I said, I know these people. I did not buy things. I didn't know that until I saw the car archive. So this is a, a lesson for me appreciate Chinese history, particularly modern history, how Japan invaded China, how they planned to invade different cities, the 1919 atrocity. <coughs> by the way, I'm, I'm sure you know the book of the Rape 19 by Harris Chow. Mm -hmm. Irish Chan was my friend, and when she graduated from Illinois, she wanted to write a book. She got a grant from MacArthur Foundation. She came to see me and said, I want to write a book about the Nanjing Massacre. I said, what do you know about Nanjing Massacre? I said, I don't know. Do you read Chinese? I don't read Chinese. How can you write? You can help me. I can't help you translate it from Chinese to English. You can help me. So this lady, very persistent, I helped her a lot in our country for two years. This is what I uh, want to work for Library Congress. And I didn't want to work for Library Congress for 47 years, maybe one year, two years. But I like a job. The job is so fascinating. It's not just you circulate books to, to readers, it's really you do research for the Congress, for the US government. It's the same time for the US government, particularly for Congress. Because that job, I had a chance to meet many <coughs> managers and 
and recovery. They're interesting challenges. Particularly during the, 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 the years before Nixon trip to China and after Nixon trip to China, Senator, every day he called me, one to one, come over to the office, want to talk about this and that, including Senator Mike Mansfield, Senator Charles Percy, Senator Hugh Scott, Ted Kennedy. He's been involved in Chinese, but Kennedy helped Chinese people for immigration problems. The job is a fascinating job. It's not, people say it's boring, you know, you're going to, like, stereotype the librarian. No, it's not that kind of a job. Because like books, like people, you have that two inches, you can be a good librarian. It's a librarian, you get in one with other scholars. That's why I was able to help people, help other friends, and stop a, fund, uh, uh, and stop a foundation, U.S. China Policy. I don't want to go into details about the library. I think this is what I really enjoy. And then in the meantime, I said, just go for library, it's not good enough. I want to, I want to get a degree in history. <coughs> and history. And why do you survive? She was already studied the third time. She said, you go to see Father Sibius. And she's a priest. She'll help you get into it. I said, I made my major with agriculture. <coughs> help me. Maybe I could have get a degree in history. I said, I'm not a farmer. Because my father wanted me to study agriculture. I follow my father based on Confucian tradition. You must listen to your father. I got a degree in agriculture in 1957. And Father Sibian talked to me. He said, Why don't you do not teach your major? How can you get history? Make up 24 credits. You will get A and B's unless you need. That's right. Finished another 24 credits in Georgia. American history, world history, European history, and five history. Four courses. And this 24 credits. I was admitted to the PhD program in Georgia. Anytime I work in that time, next time I go to school in Georgia. After seven years, long haul, finally, I come out of the I did not tell anybody for seven years. I keep a secret. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lose face. If I fail my comprehensive, where am I going to see my colleague in every comment? This guy doesn't know what he's doing. So I got my PhD. Everybody in every comment said, Shaw, how could you? He said, I call me Shaw Wang, Little Wang, how can you get this degree? We can't even get a degree in Georgia. I said, We work hard to do it. Seven years, long, long time. Mm -hmm. So anybody, want to do this, you can do it. You can get a degree from Columbia, you can get from Howard, and any place you want to do it, you can do it. No such thing you can't do it. If I can do it as a student from China, you can do it. But the thing is, do you have that uh, interest or determination? That's what it is. That's what you get a degree, make it better. At least something you want to fulfill, the wish. After I get a degree, Georgia University, I'll be a teaching job. I can't get better. I work, for, I work daytime, and every time, nighttime, teaching one course or two courses at Georgia. Since then, 68, 69. What else I can do? Nothing. I'm so happy. <coughs> you want to be so called a student. China for Chinese history. I, I was, I've been teaching Chinese history, American China relations since 59. I don't think I can ask you for any English. You mean that every summer I go to teach at different universities? Okay. Yale, Columbia, Hawaii. I'm happy. Tell you what it, I'm a happy person. That's why I can write a book. If I'm, I'm too depressed, I can write a book. <laughs> I hope that this story is not boring you. But I think I better stop here. And uh, you can read a book, you can have a book, you can have a copy. Okay. This is my third time of book signing. I, I, I did this in uh, one year twice.
nurse club and cousin club, and uh, this is uh, the third time. And uh, I see a lot of friends of mine. They know, they know my story. I want to go to you again and tell the same story. And uh, any questions? Uh, yes. If there are questions, please ask. Yes. I would like to know, uh, when you landed in New York yeah. in 1949, yeah. and you started college, I think Manhattan College, right. how did you uh, enroll if you couldn't speak English? You had a good question. I did not take any course. I took a course in English language. Before you went to Manhattan College? No, before I went to I learned Latin English language in Chinese high school. Ah. English language is required by Chinese school for fourth grade. Okay. But but when you learn a language in, in, in China, it's always not good enough. Of course. And even today, English is still my second language. You cannot be this English cannot be my first language. At least I'm born here. Yes. Having taught English in college for many years, I, I would meet many students who would insist that they know English. Mm -hmm. Some of them from India or all sorts of places. And they insisted that their English was perfect because they had studied it in their homeland. But of course, they didn't understand that there was a difference between your first language and your second language. And the kind of English you learned in India wasn't the kind of English that was very helpful in New York. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The question about English. To, to many foreign students, including Chinese, Japanese, Latin American students come here to study. If they study graduate school, it's much easier to get a degree, MA and PhD. Because if you really specialize, take a course to your special interest. You engineer, take a civil engineer course. You take an in your undergrad, you take about so many credits, English literature, Shakespeare and uh, uh, T.S. Bennett. I have no idea what T.S. What, what Bennett wrote for this. But you have to study 12 credits, four courses, English one, two, three, four. Uh -huh. Now, that was a difficult course for me. I have two other classmates from the Chinese Embassy. They all flunked out because they couldn't pass English. <laughs> I was lucky to have a teacher who's a drum rep. She was a candidate for PhD in English at Maryland University. She said, so I'm, I think you have talent in literature. She, she gave me a special coach every day after class. I began interested in you new know, new. I wish you were my student. I said to her, you get a degree from Maryland U. I passed four courses in English one to three four for the same teacher. Yes. Oh, Mr. Mike, thanks very much for a your story. It's very compelling. Um, the question I have as you continue to lecture about the U.S.-China relations. What do you think is most misunderstood about China in the United States and also about the United States in China? Well, <laughs> that's very good, very, very good question, very difficult question. I really don't know how to answer your question, but I think it's a, uh, the, the Chinese people probably understand more about America because in China there are more people that are English, they read more American newspapers, they have more interest in America. How many Americans are really interested in China? Only the business people. How many students? Very small percentage. Now, we have about, we have about hundreds, more than 100,000 Chinese students from mainland China mm -hmm. in the United States. But how many Americans are <coughs> in China? As we need more young people from this country to go to China and stay there, not just a summer, stay there for That wouldn't help you. Not only to travel to Xi'an, to, to, uh, to Shanghai, I said, come back. And you really didn't learn the language. You really didn't learn anything about the city. But you still, together with your American students, that's no good. You have to stay with your Chinese family, Chinese people. If you go to China, stay for two years, that's it. Get an MA program, get an MA degree from Beijing or whatever you in China. Then you really, you really understand China. That's why, just last few days, but it's a saga, it's a chain, 
And how many of you can write a really interesting chat? You mean since coming here, why can't you do here? You can do lots in China. Exactly. Why can't you study and why you're lost? Come to me, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, two of your mind, two very short questions. Yeah. One, um, how much of the Library of Congress is, this is my ignorance, is, it, is uh, accessible to the ordinary American citizen? And the other question is, what did you do your PhD uh, dissertation on? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell you, the Library of Congress is a fabulous library. Uh, if, if I'm still the Chinese section chief, okay, if we go to the government, I would like to have all the access to okay. But the, now the new policy is nobody can put a book stack. You only can see the catalog card. You digital, online, or maybe catalog card. That's not very good. And you can't go to see the book stack. So you don't you know what I hope because 9-11, uh, everything changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a pretty good access, but not as good as the reader one. And a lot of professors complain about this. I don't know how, when you can change to it. Like when I was there in the 1980s, 90s, and, uh, but something they will. And I think it's a, uh, you look at the digital online and not as a book itself. That's why you go to airplane, you read a book, you read on Kindle, it's different reading. <laughs> the second question about the topic my that is about Chinese world. Mm. Because I have experience. My daddy was about the young Marshal who kidnapped Chiang Kai shek <coughs> About his life from 1928 to 1931. Three years. And your uh, dissertation. Yeah. I don't think that's the title. Oh, that one. I see. Oh, that's not the title. I have a title. Young Marshal Zhang Xueliang and Manchuria, 1928 to Hi, uh, Dr. Wang. Thank you for your interesting uh, story. Uh, if you don't mind, may I ask you uh, some kind of other question, uh, large sense question? Do you mind? No, I, I think oh, like, okay. I'm uh, uh, yeah. Every morning when we uh, wake up, we uh, heard news bombing, killing. Uh, I think. Uh, most of us would uh, feel frustrated what's going on in this world. And uh, we have uh, a theory, uh, Dr. Huntington, uh, the conflict of uh, two civilizations. Now, it seems uh, the world, uh, uh, the people of the world sees uh, the events according to this theory. I don't want to explore this theory is uh, positive or otherwise. But I want to say this, uh, since you are an experienced scholar and uh, knows the history of the, of the, uh, of the Chinese and uh, Asian uh, society, uh, what about uh, the civilization of uh, the East, the Chinese? Uh, we have Confucius, Lao Tzu, and Dao, and they advocate a uh, harmonious world, balance. And uh, if you don't like this, don't impose to this on some others. So it seems to me we can explore this theory to solve as a solution to the current problems we are facing in the world. I want to, your opinion, or if you can elaborate what I'm saying here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's not a, a loaded question, sir. <laughs> I can answer your question, but I can tell you my personal uh, uh, observation and my personal uh, uh, comment. Not based on continent, uh, country, civilization kind of theory. That's something very, very controversial, and there's nobody going to agree with each other. Okay? But I 
think I agree with you. The Chinese has a long civilization. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we need people like in China, like Huntington. We need in China people like uh, maybe the past, like Hu Shi, who can introduce the Chinese civilization in a way understandable by Westerners. Now, many of the students come from China. Today, in the past, the majority of them are studying engineering and science. Mm -hmm. How many of you can you find, can you, can you tell me how many professors <coughs> teaching in major administration are teaching humanities and civilization and history? You tell me now. Only I'm not teaching computer. I discussed the same question with Dr. Jason Needham in 1976. I invited him to come to Larry Congress, give two days seminar about his experience on compiling his science and civilization in China. I asked myself, why Chinese like the art? It's a good question. He said, there should be more Chinese scholars writing about China's civilization, philosophy, in its own language, only one person written philosophy of China. Who else? Can, can you tell me, in, in the United States, the person who has written about Chinese philosophy was that the last white, he passed away. And in history, I ever talked about German in Spanish. Who else in Chinese professors to tell me? So maybe we can ask the Confucius Institute. Institute. Talk about philosophy and civilization. The different kind of uh, uh, knowledge. And I think that uh, I would say, I would recommend in the future more and more Chinese or Asian Americans, whatever, publish more books on the Eastern side of the story about human kind. Now, it's a, it, everybody in the, the West is, a, is a influenced by Western civilization. How much, like you say, what's Eastern civilization? The two most popular civilizations. I think I have something to add. <laughs> <laughs> I think people in this country should come to China and see a little more. <laughs> Particularly, no, I'm not trying to hustle for an open society. If Americans who are interested in China or the entire Asia, they should come to more events at the Lowen Society. We're functioning here as a bridge to bridge the two cultures. And once they understand what's on our mind, they'll understand better. I think this is this might be one of the answers. I mean, the answers can be so many, but I think this may be one of the answers. I think understanding will bring to uh, to uh, some kind of ex communication. Uh, some Americans say they say understand all is to forgive all. So I have a few students here. Once they understand Ch the Chinese language and see the culture as it is reflected in the language, they begin to feel differently about the Chinese, China, its culture, its history, and everything. I think this is the job that we have to do at China Institute, and particularly Heyo and myself at the Lenwen Society. Now again, I may sound like I'm hustling for my bar society, but I'm not. This is coming from the depth of my heart. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I make sense. But I, I'm trying. <laughs> 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 right. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Two more questions. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Wang. Uh, you said you are a lucky uh, man, especially you are a lucky young boy. <laughs> So you got your scholarship, you got your visa, you got good education, <laughs> and then you got your, you like your job, and the job likes you. So you're su successful and get you, 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 you deserve all your, yes, the, the title now. I very respect you. And uh, so for the people not as lucky as you, like the first generation immigrant or the second generation, so what, uh, especially when they struggling to find 
make them Americans being harmful or slur false kind of American emotions? <laughs> I wish I could answer your question. I'm not job confident. If I may, that's it. That's a lot. If I may, in the Chinese language, there is a proverb. It is "吉人天下 The meaning is, if you are a wonderful person, if you are a person who has gumption, you have the will, heaven will help you. And I think it wasn't just luck. I think Dr. Wang was being modest. Exactly. It was not exactly. just luck. He had the gumption in him. He had the will. So God came down to help him. And when I say God, it may not be one person. I'm, ta I'm talking about a divine force. So, in Chinese, it's a good saying. Which means, if you are a person of auspiciousness, or you have gumption, if, if you have good will, you have good intention. God or gods will come down to help you. So I think to answer that question, the first thing is that we must have this will in us. We will, we must have this, this, if I may, stubbornness in you. Hold on to your belief and try, as Dr. Wang mentioned before. So I think, in this is my own opinion, I might be wrong, but I don't think Mr. Wong had only luck that goes with him. <laughs> Lady luck doesn't just go with anybody. Lady luck goes with people who have the will, who have the gumption, who have the, who have the wish, who have the willpower to succeed. I hope I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> story, you mentioned that um, you wanted to go, the family wanted to go to Chongqing, but you couldn't go to Chongqing. I remember... He didn't want to go to it. It's not that he couldn't. Uh, he didn't want to go? I thought he, that was the one Japanese of the... The Japanese told him he couldn't go. Exactly. But in the beginning, it's not. Isn't Chongqing the place that the flying tigers are associated with? The American that was the war flying capital. Tigers? Wartime capital of China. And, and mm -hmm. This was during wartime. I wonder if that's why they didn't let him go. That's right. Yes. Because Japanese, I was there. I always said, Chongqing. Mm -hmm. The Japanese general could not allow anybody else to go to Chongqing. And right that way, he would help the enemy go to Chongqing. And uh, otherwise, the family wanted to go to Chongqing. But Macaulay didn't know what he could do in Chongqing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one well, final question. Speaking of your personal journey, I'm just interested. Partner is not Catholic. The, the partner must be 
taking lessons from another Catholic priest for so many times. Teach you, don't do this, don't do that. What the heck is this? It's so many <laughs> I'm not disrespect the religion, but just, and this, I, I believe, my father told me, as long as you be a good human being, that's good enough. This is what I get from listening to Dr. Wang's speech about his early life, his story of success based on his will. I feel those two lines, it means loosely, this is my, uh, far from the ideal translation. Um, 一言一动, all is quieted, quieted as the resonant sounds are uttered. With men silent in rapture and stars are dispersing. These are the two lines that enter my mind. So did I say that here we have a legend of Chinese culture, and in a way, he's a great statesman. Is it true or what? Tell my last one story. I want to say, I started the George graduate program with my wife that encouraged me. She introduced me to her professor, Bob at Jesus He gave me an open door for me to go into academia. And also because of her, she said, we only can have one person to go to work on PhD. So you go ahead, you go ahead, be the first one to finish your PhD program. And she will finish the second one. So I finished my PhD program in 69. She finished her program until my son grew up in 1987. He waited for a long time. I want to say that. One more minute. Today's event is made more memorable and emotional for me because of a wonderful, happy reun reunion between me and my god sister, the daughter of my beloved and loving grandparents, who is Dr. Xie, who is also Mrs. Wang. We haven't seen each other in years, and when I heard about uh, the news that she was coming, I was elated. And so, as, as this now, the, these days, it may sound like a little cliche to say that behind every great man, there's a great woman. I think it's the reverse. Behind a great woman, there's a great man. As such, I, I believe, is the real case in the case of Dr. Wang and Dr. Xie, Mrs. Wang. So this is my sister. I call her Jia Jia in Shanghai dialect, his sister. And this is Mrs. Xie. Now, before the book signing session official starts, the Rowan Society, we have prepared a very small, very humble gift for our uh, preeminent speaker, Dr. Wang. So, how you and I will do it.